Today, we're living in an era of unprecedented wealth and means. Never before in history have we been so prosperous. Over the past centuries, life expectancy has greatly increased, and so has our quality of life. We now have access to food, medication, information, and entertainment like never before. Yet, despite all that, depression rates have never been higher, and many people find themselves, as stated by Viktor Frankl, in a sort of existential vacuum, a state of inner emptiness. Why is that? How come happiness is so hard to come by these days? And when you think about it, what does the word happy even mean? Advertisements will have us believe it's something easy to achieve, but in reality, it isn't so simple. In this video, we will try to answer these questions and examine the topic of happiness through the lenses of science, culture, and philosophy, and look at practices and habits we can develop that might make us happier. A general and widely believed assumption is that wealth is a reliable source of happiness, so let's start there. Research companies such as Ipsos and organizations such as the World Database of Happiness of Erasmus University gather yearly data and reports on such matters. By examining their findings, however, we see no clear correlation between levels of income and reported levels of happiness. For example, a poll published in 2012 by Ipsos, consisting of 24 countries and at least 500 individuals from each region, found a slightly higher levels of reported happiness among low- and middle-income countries compared to higher-income countries, whereas a similar Ipsos poll from 2019 found high-income countries to be slightly happier. It's important to note, however, that there are many different variables that may affect the results of such polls, such as cultural differences, political turmoils, insufficient sample sizes, or other socioeconomic factors. That being said, we still see no trend in any direction between a country's average level of income and the happiness of its inhabitants. Another factor at play when discussing the relationship between income and happiness is what is known as the relative income hypothesis. This hypothesis argues that when, regarding happiness, it's not only about how much you have, but how much you have relative to your surroundings. For example, a rich individual may derive little happiness from his wealth if his neighbors are as rich as him or even richer. Meanwhile, the same individual with the same income may derive more joy from his wealth if his neighbors are not quite as wealthy as he is. What about an individual's income? A new study found that happiness does indeed increase with income, but there are diminishing returns, meaning the higher you climb, the more money you need to further increase your happiness. For example, to get from here to here, you need around $15,000, but to get from here to here, the same increase, you need around $120,000. Such findings may be explained by what is known as Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, or one of its many proposed variations. This model suggests the idea that only upon meeting the bottom needs, we are allowed to climb higher to the next level of the pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid, we have physiological needs, which is the stuff we need to survive. Food, water, clothes, these sorts of things. A person that does not have such basic needs fulfilled won't be able to afford himself the luxury of worrying about the needs in the next levels of the pyramid, such as the need for love, feeling belonged, and accepted. Imagine a person finding himself on the shores of a deserted island. His first worry will most probably be securing himself food and water. Only after securing these essential needs will he find himself occupied by higher needs, such as boredom, the need to be entertained, and feel fulfilled. Interestingly, we can also observe aspects of the pyramid among the animal kingdom. For instance, domesticated animals exhibit boredom much more often than their counterparts in the wild. The difference being the former have their first level of the pyramid secured, while the latter doesn't. If we look back at the studies from earlier, we might now be able to explain the diminishing returns, as most salaries can secure the first level of the pyramid by providing us with food, water, and so on, as well as the second level, by providing us necessities such as medicine and a roof above our head. Both of those levels are great causes of stress at the most primal of levels. Speaking of primal, what does our evolutionary past have to say on this matter? A possible theory goes as follows. Meet Caveman A and Caveman B. Let's call them Bill and Jack. They both require warm enough clothes to survive the upcoming winter. The difference between the two being that Bill finds himself easily satisfied while Jack has a much harder time feeling content. 
let's assume they have both acquired pretty much identical clothing. Bill, being prone to feel content with what he got, decides he has enough. Jack, on the other hand, never feels more than short-term satisfaction with what he has and always wants more, decides to get even better, warmer clothes. Normally, both would have survived the winter just fine. But this year, winter was especially cold and harsh. Bill, who has survived just fine until now, being happy with what he had, didn't make it through this time. While Jack, always wanting more, accumulated enough to get him through this brutal winter. Jack's genetic trait, dictating him to never feel satiated, proved beneficial when faced with greater environmental stress. Perhaps even more importantly, those who not only felt less content, but also wanted to have more than their mating competition, were more likely to be perceived as worthy and providing sexual reproduction mates. Thus, after many generations of natural selection, the genes that caused individuals to always want more and to one-up their competition became increasingly widespread across the population. The end result of such an evolutionary process is us, a species who's having a really hard time just being happy with what he has. Take a moment to look around you. Notice all the incredible things you're surrounded by that you always take for granted? Your computer or phone you're watching this very video on, your air conditioner, even the ice cubes in your beverage. We notice an interesting cycle here. We desire a thing, believing it'll make us happier, and upon acquiring it, our happiness level indeed increases, but only for a short while. Like Caveman Jack, we feel short-term satisfaction with our new possession, but after a short while, we get used to our new circumstances and our level of contentment subsides back to its normal level. The new thing which granted us so much joy quickly became our new norm. Findings by psychologist Philip Brickman and his colleagues tell the same story. They measured the levels of happiness among lottery winners and noticed that they quickly became accustomed to their new lifestyle and returned to the level of happiness they had before. If they were miserable before winning the lottery, they returned to their misery shortly after. And it doesn't just affect our need for material possessions. The same process occurs in regards to satisfaction with our career, with goals in our personal lives and so on. How long will happiness from a job promotion last? After the novelty of your recent promotion will pass, so will the burst of happiness that came with it. And again, you will find yourself accustomed to your new norm. It's worth noting, however, that a job promotion, or ranking up a belt in a martial art for that matter, probably will leave you with some positive long-term effects, such as an increased self-esteem or a higher income, but in return, it will also put more responsibility and pressure on you. And all things considered, they will somewhat balance themselves out. To illustrate this point, in his book Happy, Darren Brown shares the story of a violinist friend who struggles to find contentment despite his ever-growing success. Before rising to fame, he only wished for success, and after achieving it, he never felt it to be enough and always found new things to worry about. This tendency of ours we just described, to always return to our base level of happiness, is known as the hedonic treadmill. This hedonic treadmill is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it kept us alive in our ancient past, as we've seen with Bill and Jack, and today it pushes us forward to keep inventing and innovating. On the other hand, it keeps us in an endless loop of dissatisfaction and needless consumerism. So, we're well aware of the problem. Now, what can we do about it? There's obviously no magic pill or easy way to become instantly happy, and some of the practices we're about to discuss may be simple in theory, but can be very difficult in practice. Internalizing and implementing them into your daily routine will require commitment and awareness on your part, but let's look at some habits and practices we can develop in order to feel more content in our lives. We've talked about our tendency to take things for granted. By being aware of that tendency, we can rewrite it with gratitude. When sipping a cold beverage, think of how amazing it is that we have the technology that allows that to happen. Until around a century ago, in many parts of the world, an ice cold drink could have only been dreamed upon. Today, having a refrigerator is granted, so we don't even think about how amazing cold drinks are. Make a habit of appreciating the things everyone takes for granted. It will cause you to enjoy both the little and the big things in life a lot more. With enough awareness and practice, you can even learn to love a minimalistic and plain existence and even simpler, less fancy things. 
While for some people, social media may be a good place to form connections and socialize, it might make others feel lonelier. It can cause you to spend less time in the presence of actual people, which promotes loneliness, which in turn can promote depression. If you're one of these people, try cutting back a bit and see how it makes you feel. Another negative aspect of social media is that it promotes comparison with others. People will usually share only the good aspects of their lives and project a false sense of happiness and success. Here is a very photogenic picture of me. Here is a picture of the beautiful place I visited today. However, will they share a picture of them getting caught with an awkward face? Will they also show pictures of what their boring days look like? Not likely. That way, we can easily get a false impression that everyone else's life is always awesome, except ours. It's unhealthy to compare yourself to others, and they are probably comparing themselves with you all the same. Stoicism is a topic that deserves a dedicated video, but for now, let's focus on one of its key concepts for the sake of practicality. The Stoics of ancient Greece are renowned for their many insights, some of which still sound as relevant and fresh today as when they were first conceived thousands of years ago. One of these ideas is relinquishing control. Today we know it in the form of the famous serenity prayer which echoes its message. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. The idea is knowing to let go when the situation is beyond your realm of influence. When you have no control over a matter, trying to fight it will only lead to frustration and anger because your efforts will yield no results. By letting go and focusing on another cause that you can influence, you'll enjoy the positive outcome of your doing and an added bonus of sense of accomplishment. Mindfulness, which shares a lot of similarities with Stoicism, is also a topic that deserves its own video, but for now let's examine particular aspects of it. The practice of mindful dishwashing teaches us that washing dishes doesn't have to be a boring activity. What it is is just running water and soap. The feeling of boredom is created by you. It's not intrinsic to the action of dishwashing itself. Now, we can view negative emotions and thoughts in the same manner. An event may have made us angry or frustrated, but it was our mind that created that reaction to the event. By being aware of that fact, we realize that the only victim of our anger and frustration is us, and we can train our minds to change the way it reacts to unpleasant events. Another thing that is worth being aware of is that things pass. Think of times in your life that you experienced anger or sorrow, that you were upset with someone or something. Do you feel those negative emotions right now? Well, maybe somewhat, but definitely not in the same intensity of when they originally occurred. Just like we saw with the material things earlier, we've adapted to these emotions. That notion alone can make you feel better at the present moment. In case you're interested in practicing mindfulness, there are many great resources for it, but we personally recommend Sam Harris's excellent Waking Up app. Immerse yourself in something. Choose a goal. The emphasis, however, should be on striving toward it, not on achieving it. On the journey rather than the destination, if you will. Setting goals gives us clarity toward our actions needed to be taken, and a sense of direction and liberty that allows us to focus on the present moment. In his book Happier, Tal Ben-Shahar puts it as follows. The proper role of goals is to liberate us, so that we can enjoy the here and now. If we do not know where we are going or even where we want to go, every fork in the road becomes a site of ambivalence. Neither turning left nor turning right seems like a good choice as we do not know whether we want to end up where these roads lead. So instead of focusing on the landscape, the scenery, the flowers on the side of the road, we are consumed by hesitation and uncertainty. He goes on to note that it's important that the goals one sets to himself be of personal value and self-choice. Goals that speak to the real you, and not ones that stem from outside influence, like the need to impress or please others. We are far more likely to persist, succeed, and enjoy the journey with goals we have personal attachment to. It's important to note that while goals external to your true self won't provide you with happiness by themselves, they may serve as means to achieving the goals of your true self. If your true goal is helping others in need, making money might not make you happy, but using that money to help others might. When chasing a goal, it's important to beware of the arrival fallacy. Don't chase your goals with the notion that achieving them will make you happy, otherwise you'll set yourself up for disappointment. 
Once you'll achieve them, you'll be stuck with the feeling of, wait, that's it? This is not as awesome as I imagined it to be? So, enjoy the journey itself. Another interesting research done by our friend Daniel Kahneman proposes the idea that we have two selves within us, the remembering self and the experiencing self. The remembering self is the one accounted for remembering past experiences, and the experiencing self is the one living in the now. When regarding long-term contentment and joy, the remembering self is the one in charge. Say you returned home from a long day at work and only want to relax and watch TV. You forgot you promised your daughter you'll play with her and promise you'll make it up to her next time because you're just too tired today. Your experiencing self, the you that watches TV at the present moment, might enjoy himself more for the next hour or two. Your remembering self, the one that will exist for the rest of your life when that moment has passed, will cause you to feel bad that you disappointed your daughter at that now distant point in time. What are two hours of relaxation to years of a bitter memory? Consider this when attending a party at the expense of a prior commitment, or when spending huge chunks of money on a whim at the expense of your savings. So, we compared different cultures from around the world, examined the relationship between money and happiness, and considered some interesting psychological models and philosophies. We talked about social media, consumerism, and even looked at our evolutionary root cause of discontentment. And although there are no easy tricks to magically become happy, we now understand the question of happiness a bit better, and hopefully we've acquired some tools to help us become a little happier ourselves. Thank you very much for watching, and hopefully you found this video helpful. Since this is our first video, we will greatly appreciate if you like, subscribe, comment, or basically do anything to let us know that you enjoyed this video.